God is good to us. I lost my glasses. They fell behind the seat in the car in a place that you can't find glasses too often, but for some reason I bent over and I could see him. I said, thank you, Lord, because he wanted me to read his word to you today. It was going to be one of you if I wasn't able to find them. So we are in the Gospel of John, and we're in chapter 14. So turn with me to John chapter 14, verse 7. And if you will stand while we read God's word, please, that would be great. John 14, 7 says this. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. And Philip said, Lord, show us the father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you do not know me? Philip, he, all, um, he who has seen me has seen the father, so how can you say, show us the father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also do, and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Okay, um, for those of you that are visiting or, or haven't been with us for the past year or more, we are in the Gospel of John. And it is our um, way in church that we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And so it's taken us a little bit to get to the upper room. When we entered into chapter 13 and we entered into the upper room, one thing that, that we knew for sure was that we were about 24 hours or less away from the death of Jesus Christ. Inside that last day, inside those last moments, he has gathered his, his 12, his disciples, um, into the upper room, and, and he's going to speak to them. This is the longest discourse, of, of, that's a, a conversation or a communication that Jesus has in Scripture. And so um, when we look at it, we have to realize that this is not a public um, communication. This is him and his guys. And he's speaking to them. He's giving them examples of, of what they do. He's giving them commands. He's giving them promises. He's, he's sharing the truth. And so inside of that movement, we see the very first thing that he does is he washes their feet. He teaches them the servant's heart. He, he teaches them deep abiding love and, and humility. He washes the feet of the one that would betray him. He has to share that, that um, among the twelve, among the group, there is one that, that will betray him to the authorities that will start the process of crucifixion. He, he gives them a place of honor. He, he dips the bread with them. He gives them one last chance to, to acknowledge who he is. And, and yet, he has to go and, and do what he's going to do. Jesus then says, I give you a new command. I tell you that the world is going to know that you belong to me by the way that you love one another. This is not a real new command. This is a refresher of a command. This is like you know what to do. I am telling you right now in our little group, the intimacy, the intimacy of this this little group of, of the words that he's saying, the way that he's saying it, the way he's speaking into their hearts, into their lives, it, it, it's deep. I want us not to look past 
the men that we've already, we've already read about. When he says these things, I am going to die. And I am going to go away. And where I go, you can't go with me. There is one among you that will betray me. And, and Peter says, wait, wait, wait. Where are you going? Just tell me. I, I will go with you. I will lay down my life for you. Do you remember that? We ask our own selves. How much of our life are we willing to lay down for Christ? How much does he get? Remember I talked to you about the young man, 60-40, 60-40. He said, I, God's got about 60, I do about 40 and less. I do 60 and he does 40. That's really honest. That's, that's, that's really knowing himself. But Peter is, it, he's making a commitment to his Lord, to, to his rabbi, to the one that he's been following for all these years, to the one that he's seen walk on water and, and feed 5,000 and heal the blind and, and restore life back to Lazarus, right? He's seen things that, that prove his faith. And so he's asking a question. Last week, Jesus spoke to it. I know that you are troubled. I can see the deep trouble that you have inside of you right now because I'm leaving. Because, because I'm going, because of the betrayal, because you can't go with me. I know that you are troubled. That's when he says to them, do not be troubled, that's like a command, that's an imperative. That's like saying, I know you're troubled, but don't be troubled. Believe in me. Last week it was Thomas's turn. Wait a second. How do we know where you're going and how do we know how to get there? Everyone treats Thomas as doubting Thomas. But I would challenge any one of us, have we ever doubted? Have we ever been so sure in Christ that we would not ask a question? So last week that was our space. Can we be Thomas for just a second and ask a question? What if the Lord was before you? What question would you ask? What if he just said, I'm going, you can't go, I'm being betrayed, I'm going to be on the cross. What if this truth was before us and, and you know what, we don't want him to go. Wouldn't we ask the same way? This week it's Philip's turn. Philip says, oh, hold on a, just a second, you just said that, that we should see the Father and if we see the Father and we see you, then we see the, I don't understand it. Um, Show us the Father, and it's good. We'll, then we'll be solid. Then my faith will be secure. And I will believe. I like Peter. Because he's more like me. I, I, where you go, I'm going. Let's, let's gird up our loins and let's roll. I like Thomas because sometimes my faith isn't as strong as it should be. I like Philip because, you know, Philip is the figurer. If I can't figure it first, I'm not putting my hands to it yet. Remember Philip in the 5,000. Lord, it would take 200 denarii or more to feed all these people. He's already doing math. He's looking at the situation with thousands of men and women on this hill. Where do we get enough food? Oh my goodness, almost three quarters of a year of wages could not feed them. Very practical. There are some of us in this room whose faith is more practical than just believing. Right? I don't want us to look past the power of the trouble that's on them. I, I don't want us to look past the intimacy with which Jesus is speaking to them because Jesus wants them to what? Believe. Believe. I want you to believe in me. I've been walking with you all this time. I, I, I want you to know who I am. I'm taking these moments to secure your faith because soon it's going to be required. Because soon you're going to face things and see things and do things that, that is not common. Sometimes in our lives we face that trouble too. Have you ever been troubled? Right? We talked about that. Have you ever been troubled where, where you can't stop crying? Where you, you can't 
you're depressed and you can't get out of your funk where, where you just want to isolate and be alone. The, these things, the power and the pressure and all these things that come on us that, that bring us down, we know, right? Some of it's my own consequence. Sometimes I do not so those smart things and then I have to pay. Sometimes the consequence costs more, lasts longer, and I can choose my actions but I can't choose the consequence that comes with it. He says, do not be troubled. Believe in me. Last week we talked about that. If I take you in my office and we sit down in the midst of your trouble and I say, just believe in Jesus, we all know that Jesus is the answer, but that's not good counseling, is it? When we get there and we believe in Jesus, when our faith is that strong, and that's the first place that we go, whoo, hallelujah. But in the midst of a problem, in the midst of a trial, in the midst of this thing, my brain cannot think. Hindsight, right, at the end of it, I can look back and go, wow, God was with me in the whole thing. Hallelujah. That's the way our faith grows. We are all in process, working out our salvation in fear and trembling and growing. This is the spot that these young men are at. These are not like elders in the church. They become that. But these are 19, 20-year-old young men, young fishermen, tax collectors. These are not college students. They're not... They're not learning to be Pharisees. There is something common about them that causes Jesus to speak to them in detail like this. And so in the midst of all of this trouble, in the midst of everything, he says the words, I am the truth and the way and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Do you know what it takes to say, I am the truth? I am the way? I am the life, not a way, right? We just finished membership class. And in the Nazarene church, we do not say we are the way. We say we are a way to Jesus Christ because we are part of of the body of Christ, the huge church in the book of Acts. I would never say that you have to believe like this or you're out. We are... We're, Jesus Christ is not a way to salvation. He is the way. And inside of that belief, inside of that faith, that's, that's that foundation stone. That's, that's where everything else builds off of. If I can come to that place, the, do you know the mystery, the mystery is not that there is just one way. The mystery is that there's any way at all. Jesus Christ did not have to die for us. God did not have to redeem us. We, through Adam, made our own choice, and then consequently, through our lives, we've made choice after choice after choice that would separate us from God. Sorry. Sin is sin is sin. We all partake. The fact that he laid down his life and made a way at all. is part of the miracle. When you read John 14, 6, it should cause you To feel the power of repentance, it should bring you either to understanding or to the ground before him because of the weight of what he's trying to say. No one comes to the Father except through me. Right now we live in a world that says that's so, that's, that's exclusatory. I can, no, there has to be multiple ways. But even if there's two ways, that reduces who Jesus Christ is. If there's three ways, if there's a hundred ways, then Christ is not who he says he is. And so that brings us to these verses that we're studying today where he's saying, no, the Father and I are one. When you see him, when you see me, you see him. Philip, in his practical sense, two plus two equals four. All right, if I see, in a, okay, uh, just show me. Show me the math. Show me the way this works. 
In my brain, I'm created a little different. I need to understand before I believe, before I put my hand to it. Help me out here. Jesus says, wait, wait, wait. You, you've been walking with me all this time. We, we've spent nights together. You've, you've seen everything. We, we're in this space. This is us. How can you say that you haven't seen him when you see me? Do you remember back to chapter 5? Jesus has been saying the same thing over and over and over as we have went through the Gospel of John. To the Pharisees mostly, right? Because that was where the contention was, that was where the problem was. But the disciples were right there. They were hearing the same truth. They were being told time after time, the Father and I are one. Whatever the Father says or tells me to say, that's what I do. When the Father asks me to do something, I am obedient and I do it, but I do not do it because he forces me to do it. I lay down my own life willingly. It is the Trinity working together in oneness, but separate. Each having their own place. We're going to read next week about the Holy Spirit because Jesus is bringing him into the conversation. But he's telling them. Verse 10 is the key. Verse 10 says, Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. He's given them two, two reasons to believe in him. All right? I need you, he says to Philip. Do you not believe yet? I need you to believe this. That God the Father and I are one. That he is in me and I am in him. So my question is, do we believe that? I mean, is that part of our faith? What does it take for me to get to that point where I, where I believe something like that? I mean, does, is it going to be in a sermon? Is it going to be reading my Bible? Is it going to be in somebody's life? How, I, don't, I don't know how to get us there exactly all at the same time on the same bus. Because we're all growing at different places. We all think different. We all, we all have a little doubt about this or a need to figure this or, or have boldness that's not able to step up. My intentions are good, but ooh. I just want to read more in the morning. I just want to pray. I just want to go and serve. I, I have a list, right? We talked about that. If love is not in the forefront of what you are, the law will be. And you'll make your list and you'll have your things, you know, I have to do this in a study and teach and preach and, and then my life's going to be beautiful. That's not what he's telling them. When he says, do not be troubled, he's not saying, because I'm going to take all the trouble away. It's going to be beautiful. Your life is just going to be like on the beach. Right? I told you, I've been praying and praying for years. Does Hawaii not need missionaries too? God still leaves me in P.O. He's not saying that I will take that trouble away from you. He's declaring to him, even in the trouble that's coming, I am in the Father, the Father is in me, and I. Do you believe that? If you, you should believe, he says, because of my word, because I'm telling you that. But if that's not enough, believe in the things that you've seen. What have they seen? Walking on water, healing the blind, feeding 5,000. The woman at the well, remember? He just sits down and he talks to her. And pretty soon she declares who he is to an entire village. An entire village is saved. The woman caught in the act of adultery. And we're left asking, where's the guy? The, the law, if we're going to leave love and follow the law, the law says they both die. But for some reason, that wasn't the way it was. But he's saying, if you cannot believe me at my word, believe the things that you've seen. That's faith, right? That's how faith works. The, the world says seeing is believing. Show me the money. 
Everything that you can have in this world, fame, fortune, money, cars, whatever it is can be had right now. We live in an instantaneous gratification world. God says, if you believe in my son, you will live forever. If you weigh it out on the scales, it, and yet we've seen it. Money gone, fame gone, fortune gone, cars gone, houses gone. All of that can be lost in a second. And the eternal promise of Jesus Christ is true. All of a sudden, this hand that seemed to be lacking gets life and, and, it, and a prayer is answered. Or scripture speaks to me or I have a friend that actually reaches out and tells me, come to church. Not to join the club, but to find our Lord, to, to believe. That's the truth. One of the truths that speak to Jesus Christ actually being the way and the truth and the life is the billions of lives that have been changed when they put faith in Christ. Do you know that, that, that if there was another way in the, in the garden, remember, we're, we're going to come up with that in the, the prayer in the garden, please take this cup from me. If there was another way, he wouldn't have died. This was the way. He doesn't leave him there. He doesn't leave him there. Verse 12, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also do, and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. All right. Context, context, context. That's our rule, right? We need to understand the context around us and how he's speaking and who he's speaking to and why he's saying the things that he's saying. Otherwise, that's one of those verses that I can snatch right now. I could just pl place that one verse over my bed at night, read it every day, and I would know that the things that Jesus did, I could do. To raise the dead, walk on water, feed 5,000, right? Because that's what he says. But then I would know that I could do greater things than these. Greater. What more am I going to create my own universe? Am I, what is greater than the things that he's done? Let's not get lost. This is one, Bible students, take out your pens and papers because this is important. The rest of us, just listen because it took a long time for me to understand what he's trying to say. Do you know that somebody was healed when they touched the hem of Jesus' garment? Do you know that someone was healed when they touched the handkerchief of the Apostle Paul? Do you know that Jesus was killed and hung on a cross? Do you know that every disciple but one was martyred and some crucified upside down, some stoned while being crucified? The key is in what he says. You can do the things that I do because I'm empowering you to create the church, to take the kingdom to the world. You are going to be required to do things that you don't even know yet. And I have been saving sinner after sinner after sinner, and so will you. And, and more will be required of you because you know why? I'm going to the Father. You're not going to have me here to do the things that you need to do to establish the church in this world. What does it take, right? Right? We know that in this world we will suffer persecution, but be of good cheer because Jesus has overcome the world. I can't just say those words and then expect us to face that trouble. But millions and millions of people have been martyred since the beginning of the church. The Apostle Paul was stoned to death, drug outside of the city. They gathered around him, prayed over him. He rose up, went to the next city the other day, the very next day. Did they heal the bruises too? Because when you get stoned to death, you're down. And yet he was empowered to do the next great thing. He was empowered to, to speak that next word. 
It's not just the, the miracles. Do you know how bad we want to read that verse and say, oh man, I'm going to do some miracles. I'm going to lay some hands on people. People are going to walk. It's going to be, it's not just the miracles. We focus on that. But what he's saying is when you ask for wisdom, when you lack wisdom and ask for it, don't worry, I will give it to you liberally without reproach. That means God's not going to call you stupid when he gives you wisdom. He's not going to mock you because you don't know. He's going to give you wisdom. When I need grace, I'm going to get grace. When I need to love, do you know that's probably one of the sources inside of me that's the most difficult thing? That I need to know something greater. Because love came out of Christ. It doesn't naturally come out of me. I struggle with it. I want it to. So I pray. So I ask. When he says these things, how are you going to get over this? He says, ask in my name. When we ask in his name, what are we doing? We're praying. Because he's already went to the Father. He's not right before me. Now I'm asking. Now I'm praying. Verse 13, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Ooh. <laughs> this is another dangerous verse. This is very dangerous. Anything you ask in my name, I will do. Woo! Let's go, right? Do you remember here just a few months ago, what did I ask for? When we, we, we jumped ahead and got to this verse and I said, man, anything you ask in the Lord's name, he will give you. And I said, you know what I want? I want a truck. I want a truck and I want it to be big and black and shiny. And, and do you know the very next week the Lord gave me a truck? It's a miracle. James tells us we don't have because we ask amiss. Because we ask to spoil it back on ourselves. What Jesus is saying is you guys are going to, you're going to be in the furnace. You're, you're going to be persecuted and tortured unto death. And if you ask me, for help in that I'm going to answer because me and the Father are in this together and I am in this with you that's a promise we can count on what is your trouble today what are you facing is it, is it sickness is it, is it our sin is it what what are you struggling with What's the hardest thing about faith in Jesus Christ for you to figure out? What's the biggest stumbling block? Like, he's the only way. What do you doubt? In these moments right here, in, in this little section of John, Jesus is answering the things that we need to know the truth about. And he's telling us the way to do it. Remember what we always say, it's not how, it's who. Same three letters. It's not how, it's who. And what he's trying to teach these young men is it's me that you need to believe in. I want us to move into the promises of the Lord. Next week, um, is one of the most amazing promises we can have. So read ahead. I'm not making light of the promises that are included in this section. I'm not trying to dampen them down so that, that we don't pray with expectation of, of him answering every prayer. We're, we're told to pray without ceasing. I want us to pray and, and ask in his will and in the discovery of his faith and, and be in this space, and there is a danger. In the book of Acts, a, a sorcerer sees the apostles doing these miracles and says, 
I want to buy some of that. It'll be good for my business. And that's dangerous. And many times we live in a world where that's common. I actually want to find the place of these three men. Lord, I, I just don't understand yet. But, but show me. Show me and, and I will believe. And, and even then, eventually, I may lay down my life. But I will pray, and I will ask, and I will stand in faith and, and grow me. Grow us as a church together. And we will see the Father and the Son. Do you know how you see Christ now without him before you? In your Bible. So this week, open up your Bible. Read the red letters. Read the stories. Read, just read, not to study. Just read to hear his voice. Okay? Because that's what he's doing right now with these men. Just hear my voice. Because I am with you. So this week, if the Lord is with you, what, what do you face? Where are we going? What, how much love is going to have to be given this week? How much grace? How much wisdom? How will I ever figure it out if I, if I doubt? Take it away from me. Doubt is like a little seed. Fear is like a little seed. Hate is like a little seed. But so is love and faith and hope and joy and peace and gentleness and faithfulness and even self-control. Allow that to take place. I don't want to let you go. This is one of my sh shorter sermons. <laughs> so I'm just kind of killing time right now. No. <laughs> I joke. I love you very much, and, um, and I want the Lord to go with you this week. So ask, okay? Ask him to, and he will. Go in his grace. You are loved. Amen.